All right, guys, this is just to review some of the things that we've talked about with PCR before or polymerase chain reaction. And we've talked about three steps that are required in each stage, the denature step, the anneal step, and the extend step. And we now know what's happening in each one. The denature step, which is what you're seeing first, is the separation of the DNA. The anneal step is the primer that's coming into the picture to latch on to the single-stranded DNA. And then the extend is when the polymerase will finally come in and begin to slapping the base pairs on that's going to be important uh, in order to replicate your DNA strand. Uh, very often, you know, we're talking about forensic science and forensic chemistry here, and you do see that basically on the screen, but we can also talk about DNA in other forms. We can look at medicine, we can look at environmental microbiology, genetic research, food and agriculture can actually use genetically modified organisms, right? And we want to maybe take a look at these to figure out what's going on inside the structure. And then up at the top, consumer genomics. So this area of DNA is going to be pretty important, and it really spans outside of the forensics laboratory. And I just kind of wanted to pop this up on the screen just to kind of in the back of your mind know that this kind of technique and this area is going to span across multiple disciplines, not just in the forensics laboratory or in the forensic chemistry side of the house. So here is a representation, maybe a prettier representation of the template DNA and how it separates through the denaturing step. And then we allow it to cool down so the primers can go on to the DNA. And then we heat it back up a little bit so that way the polymerase can come onto the DNA strand and then begin to replicate it. And we get a new DNA template that begins to get formed. We also talked about the ingredients that are needed. And the ingredients were, of course, the DNA polymerase, which is TAC, the DNA primers, which are specific, and you can pick those if you want to, the NTPs, which are the base pairs that are going to be needed for the replication, the buffer, so that way you can control pH, and the bivalent cations. Uh, bi means two, of course, and this is going to be magnesium and maybe some monovalent ones like potassium that would be included in the buffer. Uh, that allow the enzyme to do its job. So what do I put all these things in, right? That's the thing. This PCR master mix or super mix and my DNA sample, I put the into the PCR instrument. Well, what exactly do I put in them? Uh, or uh, where do I put them, I guess is the better way to say it. Uh, well, I would need what we call a PCR tube. All right, and the PCR tubes will typically hold anywhere between 10 to 200 microliters. And thin walls are going to be the best. And the reason is because we're going to be involving heat. And we want to make sure that the sample heats up, not just the tube. So if these are thick-walled PCR tubes, that could prevent some of the heat to basically transfer to the DNA sample and the primers and the polymerase. And we don't want that to happen. So thin-walled are going to be the best. PCR tubes, because those are made to fit down into a PCR instrument. So thick plastic makes it very hard to do the job. 20 to 40 repeated temperature changes. We've already talked about those, and we call that a full thermal cycle. So normally, these 20 to 40 repeated cycles will have an elongated period in the beginning and an elongated period in the end. Um, we call this the start and, of course, the end cycle. So this is just our way to make sure that everything is legitimate and everything kind of makes sense. That's really why we're after that. Okay, The settings, though, on that will really be determined by the PCR mix that I am making or that I am ordering. Sometimes they do not require the extended periods, and sometimes they do. So it really just depends on what they have done to make my job, hopefully, a little bit easier. Here's a picture of the PCR tubes. All of these are connected. It makes your job, again, a little bit easier in the laboratory, especially if you have to do multiple samples. So inside of each PCR tube, there will be PCR master mix, 
and there will be a DNA strand or template that you would like to replicate. So here I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I've got eight different samples in total. I can put all eight of those into the PCR instrument and it will replicate all eight ones if that's what I want it to do. Uh, I also want to make sure that the PCR tubes are what we call DNA free. You know, if these are not sterilized or if they've been handled by other people, then that DNA can also make its way inside of the tube, and that can be regarded as a contaminant. And I don't want that to happen. So DNA-free is going to be kind of important when it comes to these tubes and to a real working laboratory. They are also one-time use. Once I use them one time and I am done with that DNA sample, then I can typically throw them away. Uh, if I'm working in a laboratory and I want to hold on to that DNA sample, then I can, but these things will need to be frozen. So frozen DNA is going to be much better than refrigerated. It will stay a little bit longer for you and more stable. So one-time use. After that, if I don't think that I need that DNA sample anymore, though, I then can trash them, tube and all. All right. Uh, next, they're also fairly cheap. You know, 25 bucks for a thousand of them. So these things get processed all the time in a laboratory. They are nothing but plastic, and they're kind of tiny, too, at the same time. So they should not be expensive. Uh, and uh, I'm actually surprised because this is a requirement for PCR to work. So I'm like toilet paper and paper towels. It's a necessity, and I'm very surprised that they don't start jacking the prices up on those even more than what they have in the past. All right. Uh, as far as the steps of the PCR, we've talked about those already. So you can go through and, and pause this video maybe and take a look at what's on the screen. But it's nothing new. No uh, extra information here uh, other than the elongation step in the beginning and the end. So those m might be a little bit of extra time uh, that goes along through. And I've also noted the time intervals here on normally the steps. So, for instance, in the denaturization step, that will last for about 20 to 30 seconds. The annealing step to allow the primer to come in and find where it needs to go, that's normally 20 to 40 seconds. The elongation step, that elongation step will typically be the longest and it will go anywhere between 5 to 15 minutes. Uh, finally, the hold will be an indefinite amount of time. That's really up to you to figure out and what your preference is. In the initialization step in the beginning, uh, that can also be kind of the kickstart to this whole process, and that can be for 1 to 10 minutes. All right, so the initialization step, 10-minute time period, just to get all the juices flowing, and then the denature, anneal, and elongation step, those will happen for a handful of seconds apiece or a couple of minutes. And then the hold at the very end will be indefinite. By the time you get to it, then, um, you know, that's when you can take it out and work with it from that point. Here's another diagram of the PCR that we have talked about now. So just the separation, replication, separation, replication over and over again. We now have an instrument that will do this for us, but earlier back in the day, this was an older PCR instrument. So you would typically see three water baths that's down there at the very bottom, and those water baths each would be set at a different temperature. And now you know why. Each step of the PCR requires a different temperature setting. So this might be in the beginning, sorry, this might be in the beginning of 95 degrees, and this middle one might be the lower 60 degree one, and then this last one might be the 72 degree step. Again, those have wiggle room as far as temperature settings go, but there you go. That's why there's three baths at the very bottom. Also keep in mind that some of these were like 30 seconds. So could you imagine standing at this thing all day long and transferring tubes from the 95 to the 60 within a matter of 30 seconds or 45 seconds or so? And then keeping it into the last one for a little bit longer, but then putting it back into the 95 well and repeating that process over and over and over 30 or 40 times throughout the day. 
This is why PCR was hated by many in the very early stages of the PCR analysis, right? Who wants to do this? Who wants to stay by this water bath and keep transferring these crazy PCR tubes from one to the other? But that's now why we have instruments like this. And this is where PCR is now. It is not really a water bath. It is a heat block. So we just plug it up into the wall. And then this PCR, the way it's made, is that there's four chambers, actually. So four different people can really use this if they want to. And each one can be ran at different temperature settings. So this is a fancier thermal cycler or PCR instrument. Uh, and I would put my PCR tubes down into the well. And then I would close this lid down. And then on the screen, I would basically go to that particular area of the instrument. And I would say, these are the temperatures, and this is how long I would like for you to keep it at this temperature. And this is how many cycles that I would like for you to complete. And then I would hit run. And then three hours later, I would come back, and this machine will have done it for me. So this has made PCR much more palatable to people in a laboratory. No longer is it anything that looks like this, old school, more manual, why, who has time to do all of this all throughout the day? It is now much more automated, a little bit cleaner, a little bit more user-friendly, uh, and it just really requires some PCR tubes and an electrical outlet. That's it. No more water baths, no more temperature regulations. It does it all on its own. All right? So that is today's PCR and today's thermocycler. We do have one. It doesn't look like this, though. We have a simpler model. But we do have a thermocycler that you will be using in through your lab experiences with this class. So that's it of PCR. And now we need to go back and we need to talk about once we get the PCR, well, where did the DNA come from in order to PCR it? So we're kind of working backwards here. So electrophoresis is going to be the final result. We now know we need to PCR it in order to get electrophoresis accomplished. So where does the DNA come from that we want to replicate? How do we get it? So that's what we're going to talk about in the very next video.